Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Let me ask you a question. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, I know what you're thinking. That's a stupid question, and we already know the answer. But do you? Because you see, every egg has the property of having been laid by a chicken, and every chicken has the property of having hatched from an egg. So which came first? In fact, the only conclusion one can draw from this regression is that there has to be an original chicken, and that this original chicken was created by the deity of Bronze Age desert dwellers on a Friday 6,000 years ago. Well, that's essentially the argument Inspiring Philosophy made in his last video. Because if we were to use one particle to collapse another, what was used to collapse that particle, and so on and so on. It was Niels Bohr that pointed out we cannot specify the wave function of an observed particle separately from the other particle that is used to measure it. In other words, the wave function of a particle cannot be unentangled from that of whatever is used to measure it, and so on and so on. Basically what this means is when one photon is measured by another, they entangle. If one particle measures another, it inherits part of its wave function, so to speak. And that particle, which is supposed to be measuring, cannot be fully explained without what it is measuring. So you need another measuring device to collapse that initial measuring particle to a definite state. But then you need something else to collapse that measuring apparatus as well, and so on and so on. This creates a chain of material objects in a superposition of measuring, which is known as a von Neumann chain. Since quantum laws are what truly describe all material objects, some other particle or measuring apparatus is always needed to collapse the next one in line. You keep going back until you get to something that would be non-local, outside the entire material system, which escapes this chain by not being bound by the same physical laws, and is able to cause final collapse of everything in the chain, which is argued to be a conscious observer, something beyond the material, with the ability to collapse the entire physical system. So just like in the egg or chicken problem, inspiring philosophy presents a chain of events, each event having the property of being preceded by an event with the same property. This of course leads to a regression, and this regression requires a starting point. 2300 years ago, the philosophers concluded that the starting point for their egg and chicken regression has to be a god. Just as Inspiring Philosophy concludes now that the starting point for his regression is a god. A god, no less, that is described by laws that are not applicable to the universe. A totally unprecedented god. In fact, the only thing you can argue for, like in the egg or chicken problem, is an original chicken. A chicken that did not hatch from an egg or in your case, a measuring device that doesn't have a wavy nature. And despite your most fervent desires, measuring devices tend not to be conscious. But you are arguing for a grand consciousness that permeates the voids of space. A grand consciousness that presumably holds the universe on a leash, like a poodle, so that it doesn't jump about and fuck the vicar's leg. And we all know that you are using the word consciousness to mask the Bronze Age roots of your thought process. But let's analyze your argument a little further. You propose a chain of von Neumann measurements. In a von Neumann measurement, you have a system and a measuring device. The system is denoted by a linear combination of eigenstates phi, and the measuring device comes as a set of base vectors n. You put these together, apply the rules of quantum mechanics to it, and you get uh, an entangled state between the system and the measuring device. Now you say that this is still a wavy state. And yes it is, so we need to apply another measuring device. But this doesn't solve our predicament, so we keep applying measuring devices until there isn't a photon left in the universe. What we end up with is a state for the entire universe, which consists of an entanglement of all the particles we find in the universe. Now we could interpret the terms in the sum, these entangled states, 
as different worlds. And I think you know where I'm getting at. Because this is basically the thought process or a simplified version of the thought process that leads you to the many worlds hypothesis. So if we consequently apply the rules of quantum mechanics on which you base your argument to your argument, we end up eliminating the measurement problem from inside the universe. Because you see, within one of these entangled states, everything is collapsed relative to everything else. So everything would behave just as we would expect it to behave. Everything would be subjectively definite. Now we can't now as long as these states don't interact with each other, we can't tell whether the sum has one term or whether it has many terms. If it has one term, the universe would be absolutely definite. There would be one universe. And in this case you could propose your god or you could propose any other uh, process that collapses an entire universe. Or we could have many states and the universe would be subjectively definite. Well, at this point I really wanted to end the video. Probably with a sincere application of derogatory linguistics aimed at inspiring philosophy's tendency to willfully misinterpret quantum mechanics. But no just as I was collecting my final thoughts. Inspiring Philosophy uploaded a new video about the many worlds hypothesis. But it's not really about the many worlds hypothesis. It's about Inspiring Philosophy's most favorite topic in quantum mechanics. Yes, I'm talking about the conscious observer. The conscious observer, if you have watched a number of Inspiring Philosophy's videos, creeps up at every moment it can creep up. So I guess I need to talk about what an observation is in quantum mechanics and why it isn't as conscious as inspiring philosophy would like it to be. In an experiment, depends on what we initially put in. It basically shows when we perform an experiment, the result is dependent on the experimental context or the choices of the observer. So as they simplified it in the New Scientist magazine, the values you obtain when you measure its properties depend on the context, so the value of property A, say, depends on whether you chose to measure it with property B or with property C. In other words, there is no reality independent of choice of measurement. Rosenblum and Kuttner point out in the basic double slit experiment, we select what part of nature to probe and therefore choose one set of possibilities over another. If this is the case, then it is hard to deny that reality acts independent of our choices. In almost every video about a scientific topic, Inspiring Philosophy will at some point remind his audience that consciousness is a fundamental principle of the universe. That the universe is somehow shaped by pure consciousness. Which is remarkably similar to Deepak Chopra's argument for quantum healing. But I would disagree. Well, let's imagine that we are performing a double slit experiment. So we have an electron gun, a double slit configuration, and we have a screen that measures electrons on the other side. So the electron gun sends off an electron, it passes the slits and it is detected by this, on the screen. In this configuration we will get an interference pattern on the screen. Just as if the electron uh, went through both slits at the same time and interfered with each other, like water waves or like waves of light. Now we can try to find out through which slit a single electron from our electron gun goes. And that would be quite interesting, wouldn't it? So we put detectors here after the slits and then we send our electrons. If we do that, the outcome of the experiment changes dramatically. Instead of the interference pattern, we'll get two lines of electrons behind the slits. So the electron, just like a billiard ball, travels through the slit and hits the detector. Travels through the other slit and hits the detector. Just what it, it, In fact, this is the outcome we would imagine if we were living in a completely classical world. So we have two configurations and two different outcomes. And by choosing one of these two configurations, we, the experimenters, can decide which outcome we get. And if you don't think of this uh, about this too hard, 
you might come to the conclusion that yes, our conscious decision is what um, decides the outcome. But what if the cat somehow gets into the laboratory and it, it disconnects or it switches these detectors off? And we actually wanted to measure well the electrons directly behind the slits and the cat switch our detectors off. So what will the outcome then be? In fact, the outcome will be an interference pattern. Inspiring Philosophy even made two videos about exactly such experiments. Well, in these experiments they didn't use a cat. They used what is called a quantum random number generator, which has several advantages compared to a cat. But you get a result that depends on the experiment, but the decision on how the experiment is configured, is set up, is not made by the human, it is made by a random number generator. These experiments are called delayed choice quantum eraser experiments. And what scientists want to do in these experiments is um, they want to test the properties of entangled particles. Entangled particles, um, if you have an entangled particle pair, and if you change the property of one of these particles, the property of the other particle in the pair will instantly change um, in a similar way. So these particles seem to communicate. And um, we want to find out how this communication occurs, or we want to find out things about this communication. So one setup for this experiment is you have a double slit configuration, and you send, say, an electron or a photon. Doesn't some some particle that's, that behaves that behaves nicely. Send this through the slit, and after the slit, you split the particle into an entangled particle pair. One of the one particle in the pair is sent off immediately, and immediately detected, undisturbed by a detector on a screen. So uh, you and. and if it wasn't an, if you, if you wouldn't do anything else, you would get an interference pattern here. The other particle in the pair is sent on a longer route, is is basically delayed, and then it goes through a configuration uh, that can measure through which slit the particle went, or it can simply leave the particle undisturbed. And what scientists want to find out is whether the, the result of this particle, of the particle that is measured immediately and undisturbed, depends on whether it's whether there is whether the, the information about which slit the particle went through is measured at the other side or whether it is not measured. And the important bit for this, about this experiment is that they want to test out local hidden variables. So a local hidden variable, for instance, would be so if you have your undisturbed measurement here, and say you want on the other side you measure the information, you measure the path information. It's called path information. So you get for which path the electron goes through. So the electrons at the point where the electron is split into, into an entangled pair, the setup of the experiment is already defined. And so the setup of the experiment could be some local hidden variable that the electrons know, for lack of a better word, um, and then they behave accordingly. And scientists want to avoid this because they want to test whether local hidden variables um, exist. So this decision on whether to measure through which slit the electron goes or whether to leave the delayed electron undisturbed must be made randomly. And the best form of random number generator we currently have is a quantum random number generator. And in fact if scientists perform these experiments they find that um, when that when this um, when they measured the, the two slits, 
you will get two a, a two slit uh, as you will get the the slit pattern here and when you leave the, the the particle undisturbed you will get the interference pattern here in this class of experiments in a class of experiments that inspiring philosophy um, presented twice in two separate videos where he talked at length about this um, consciousness is completely and necessarily removed from the equation otherwise the experiments wouldn't work the experiment wo wouldn't the experiments wouldn't yield any results that are useful so no in a delayed choice quantum eraser experiment the decision on how the measurement is set up is not made consciously and the outcome of the experiment depends on this decision but it depends on this random decision. Well, IP, I think I have demonstrated that your ideas constitute little more than a collage of fancy graphics and quote minds accompanied by the music from an end times movie, all in order to coax your audience into believing that your arguments have any merit at all. Yes, they're fancy and they sound scientific, but at the end of the day, they are just wishful thinking and egg or chicken problems. And at least for me, this isn't a satisfactory interpretation of quantum mechanics.